everyone. I'm super excited to be um, moderating this panel today. Thank you everyone for coming to join. It's been a great conversation thus far. We'll try not to uh, repeat a lot of the conversation, but there will be some overlap, I think, with some of the topics that have been previously discussed um, amongst the stakeholders that we have here today, which is a diverse group uh, from healthcare executives uh, to founders and also data aggregators. Um, I'm a principal at Pender Ventures, uh, as you mentioned. We're a venture capital firm focused on the intersection of health IT and enterprise technologies. Um, our panel discussion today is around exploring the innovative solutions to integrate data and drive better health outcomes. Uh, you know, working as an investor, I see firsthand some of the challenges and opportunities uh, to utilize data, capture data, uh, to drive better health outcomes. And, and, and so I thought I would structure our conversation around the sequencing of events that needs to take place and capturing, accessing and integrating and usage and feedback loops as well. Um, so I'll kick it off with Heidi today. Um, it's actually one of the last topics that was discussed in the previous fireside chat, but around um, there's so much data that resides in the EMR. And I'd love your perspective on how we can reduce the paperwork burden or what EMR companies can do to reduce that paperwork burden uh, with our practitioners while keeping data structured. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, there is an enormous amount of data that is collected intentionally in EMRs, as well as data that can be collected with sensors or as the healthcare moves through care of patients. And so with what we're approaching the issue of data capture with is through alternative methods of data collection to reduce uh, caregiver burnout and paperwork time in healthcare. So this can include uh, what we've built already is including video voice collection, um, as well as clinician led automated charting. With your EMR, what we don't wanna see is that Microsoft Word and Google Docs is still more efficient than using the EMR because of what was discussed today, you know, too many clicks, uh, too many complex screens and things like that. So automated uh, and alternative data collection, I think is where we need to move to. We, we, we I was thinking about also moving beyond the GP and, and, and Brian, this is a question for you just around, obviously Providence is a multi-facility healthcare system. And I was just wondering some of the work that you've done to better capture and structure data across the healthcare continuum, um, but also just highlighting any technologies as well that you've had to embrace um, for that. For sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we we undertook a, a Cerner implementation um, through all our sites. So I think like when you think about um, Part of data data capture is is having more structure more control uh over the data so we did things like implement um you know the the med, med uh we did uh you know barcode scanning on lab samples and so things that that they, they do create um additional steps and work but they're creating uh downstream benefits in terms of the the data captured um and then how that data can be used um so the emr is one part um and 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 any health uh, care organization, you have multiple systems that you're dealing with. And, and so you can have like your EMR really nailed down, but you've got a lab system or you've got an imaging system. And so our approach um, at Providence to this is we've we've invested in, you know, an Azure cloud solution that is essentially a data layer that allows us to connect to our different systems and then ask questions of that system. And so we see this as a path forward. We're never going to get away from having multiple systems, uh, different vendors, different technology. Um, and so we're trying to build above and build, you know, in the cloud, so to speak, um, and then use that to enable um, our, our data and query tools and, and hopefully in the future, even just our own internal applications that will help people better navigate and use the data. Perfect. It's um, really helpful, uh, actually, and, and, and I think this will uh, come into play in, as our conversation goes on as well. Um, for, for Brent, 
as a aggregator and 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 I know that your slogan is better data, better decisions, healthier Canadians. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm curious on on your perspectives on hurdles that your team has overcome mm -hmm. to capture and structure data from a multitude of different different stakeholders. Um, again, highlighting any technology solutions that uh, you've had to embrace as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and it's it's a pleasure to be part of the event and and part of the panel. Um, we're a bit unique, perhaps, um, or my, I'm a bit unique in in the participation here. In that, you know, we're a, we're a government funded organization, uh, but independent from governments. And really, you know, I think better data, better decisions, healthier Canadians really explains what we do. Um, and what we're here to do is to support decision making in health systems, in policy, and in other arenas, and to um, sort of aggregate and enrich and then make data available in different ways, uh, turning it into information, of course. And I just can't emphasize enough that, um, you know, in our sort of pan-Canadian purview that, that it, you know, it really comes down in terms of better capture and structure. I think there's two things. Um, obviously, the first one is standards. Standards are critical, um, content standards, uh, exchange standards, privacy standards, standards around the governance uh, of data as, especially. Um, and really, sir, where we've seen success uh, over time in uh, uh, improving the capture and structure data is, is in a, a few areas. One is embedding uh, content standards at the point of service, at the point of payment, or more recently, and a panelist already mentioned it, sort of naturally occurring collection of information data that's really important to decision making. Um, and so really trying to see more opportunities to embed those standards at the source so that as data flows through for patient care, for uh, patient access uh, through to system management and on to research and innovation, that the standards is it's sort of a you know collect once use often is 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 the um, the point of view. I'd make the point that we have many applicable standards and classification systems and coding sets uh, for use in Canada, and one of our challenges is we don't follow them all the time. And so I think it's really important, first of all that we um, don't over perceive uniqueness and that we and that we have some discipline and I think improved governance in the country are, and convergence around certain types of certain standards uh, for the betterment of the data ecosystem, which is for the betterment of health systems and uh, for the outcomes for people. And then the second area, standards is key, but the second area is of course, the role of technology in managing data burden. Another panelist also talked about the proliferation of, of, of content and data in EMRs. Well, we see that in the system generally. And there are opportunities uh, for us to, first of all, rationalize data, collect once use often, but to also take advantage of things like sort of data integration and data linkage through things like um, natural language processing and AI, to, to really, um, you know, I think rationalize and make the data systems more efficient, more timely, um, but also decrease and critically the burden. Uh, and others on this, uh, in this event have talked about burden. I think part of this and, and really successfully looking at where and how data is captured in the system, we have to provide more attention to workflow uh, and the burden on, on healthcare workforce. I think, you know, we see studies on the amount of time that people in the healthcare system spend entering data. And yes, it's digital, but we I think we can do better on that. It's a perfect segue from your comments on structured data to also potentially now talking about the opportunities for unstructured data. And Ahad, I'd, I'd, I'd love to know your perspective um, as, uh, a platform that's going to have a ton of unstructured data. We were talking about things like capturing tone and inference in virtual cares. Um, just would love for you to elaborate more on the opportunities to capture uh, unstructured data as well, um, and, and also how other tech platforms that you've seen are tackling this, this opportunity. Great. 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, th thank you for having uh, having me, Kendall. Um, and um, yeah, one of the benefits, one of the many benefits of virtual healthcare is the opportunity to gather gather data uh, passively, right? And as you kind of refer to there, you know, there's intonation softwares where you can hear the rise and falls in in a patient's uh, tone, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, pauses, uh, 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 speed at which they speak, right? You can look at things like facial recognition software where you dive in deeper into micro expressions that can be indicative of psychological distress or emotional distress, right? And then there's things like some of the things that we do where we look at linguistic cues through forms of natural language processing that, that Brent had just referred to, right? In which here you have a session, you know, you have a transcript of the session um, uh, and it's unstructured data to, in, in that regard. And it, you know, um, analyze for linguistic cues, right? You know, um, <clears throat> how does one express themselves? What are the, some of the subconscious language that they use? Things like, you know, auxiliary verbs, uh, pronouns, conjunctions, right? Some of these words are processed in your brain at two tenths of a second. How are they used? In what context are they used? And how can they help inform um, the type of care that you deliver? Because the, these words are quite indicative of our psychological and emotional um, dispositions. And so, you know, uh, a company is even in the states. You know, uh, I feel like a, a company called Listen. That I think they, they do a pretty good job around that. Um, you know, that's an area that we're that we've explored and we're continuing to work in and working alongside clinicians to say, hey, you know, <clears throat> here's some data that can help you make better informed decisions in collaboration with all the different pieces that you may be covering, right? And oftentimes when we look to capture data, we sometimes, particularly in behavioral health, we use like subjective measures. Hey, Kendall, are you feeling better? Uh, if so, tell me how you feel better or so something to that degree. And if I'm trying to avoid a specific diagnosis, I'm probably not going to answer that uh, to, to the with the mo most truthfully, right? And so having that ability to capture objective data, particularly in the space of behavioral health, using some of these mechanisms, I think can really help to push forward some of the outcome, um, positive outcomes we're hoping to have. Quick, a quick follow-up question in that regard is, is I have seen those similar type solutions in other industries. For example, customers, customer support services and trying to get inference over if a customer's happy or are they actually negative, but they're telling you that they're happy. And I'm just wondering about the potential to use technologies from other industries and applying it towards health and 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 how much room do you think there is there? Yeah, yeah, I definitely think there, there's a ton of room um, for, for those opportunities, right? Like, I mean, if you think about any time you see a physician Part of, part of what you're doing is getting to know this individual, right? You're trying to better understand the patient, what are their health behaviors? Uh, you know, some of the most successful uh, relationships you have with patients is if, once you've developed that rapport, right? And you kind of help some sort of like back and forth with the individual and, and, and you can speak openly with them. And so better understanding where the patient actually exists in that relationship, right? Better understanding, you know, does rapport exist between the two? Is there a patient satisfaction actually occurring? Are, are patients confused about some of the information that they're getting? Or are they being responsive and showing some sort of even empathetic disposition to what the physician is saying? It's going to go a long way in improving, um, in improving health outcomes, right? Perfect. Yeah, I could not agree more. Um, and as we now move from the conversation on capturing data, we'd love to bring it to how do we better access the data that we've captured? And that includes interoperability, integration as well. Um, and Brent, I, I, I thought I would kick it off with you here in terms of you talking about the work that you and your organization have been doing on better accessing information, but also interoperability as well. Um, and where do you think there's challenges ahead as well um, versus also the opportunities? Thanks. No, happy to start on this one. You know, it, my sense is that um, improved access to data and information uh, is enabled by interoperability and standardization, um, but that's not all uh, that's required. In fact, um, I think that, uh, um, you know, we, in some cases, we, in some, in some sectors, we have pretty good interoperable data 
flow, but um, uh, the, the usage isn't where we want it. So I think, and, and the, the expert advisory committee, the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy, which uh, Vivek talked about earlier, um, addresses this well. So policy harmonization is a key one. I think we have, um, you know, Health, health information legislation across the country, and we have organizational policies around data access and data management. Uh, it's a real patchwork across the country and looking for opportunities to um, see, you know, greater consensus and harmonization of policy moving from, as has been mentioned, um, sort of a more of a, custo a custodian model to a stewardship, mo stewardship model where it's enabling appropriate use uh, for specific purposes is the goal, uh, not protecting the data and keeping it really tight. Again, always talking about appropriate use, but that this is a, a mindset change. This is really important, and that's really enabled by um, this issue of building trust around appropriate use of health data and also data literacy. Because part, you know, part of uh, uh, you know improving access is is uh, awareness of what's available uh, and how to appropriately access and use it. So I think those are some some key things. And and I think there's been a big shift. Just to finish, there's been a big shift. I think organizations tended to tackle their data access issues and their and their information access issues sort of in their own silos in the past. And I think what what the um, the EAG reports from the Pan Canadian Health Data Strategy and what we're seeing in the country is a recognition that health data is in an ecosystem. There are many actors on the supply and the demand side, uh, and that we need to work together and have sort of a coordinated and shared approach and shared accountability around that to really move things forward. Because it's when you, in the pandemic, demonstrated this, it's when you bring critical health system and public health and population health data together, for example, that we can really understand better what where the issues are and what needs to be done. Heidi, I imagine that you'll have some perspectives on those comments around custodian versus stewardship, uh, how to improve interoperability um, with our technology systems and also the idea of supply and demand. Um, so could you talk about some of the work that you're proud of that Guardian has done to challenge, to tackle these challenges and also the work that is ahead as well? Definitely. Um, I absolutely agree with everything that Brent was saying because it is about that there's been varying approaches and models applied in the market. And then there's things that have been built very niche for very specific professions and other things that were built on a very general approach. And so with our work that we've done with Guardian Bridge, it was all about how do we approach this from a top-down approach where we can include all professionals and bring the patient into their care and kind of what Brian was talking about earlier, how do we tap into these multitude of softwares that have been really approaching the problem with completely different models? So with the guard with the idea that we need to, to control the who, when, and why of data movement um, because we had to assume that some of even some of the older software models, you know, don't have that same internal security uh, that our system has. So uh, we have really great um, legislation and standards and organizational policies around external security for software, but there's a lot of variation in what is allowed for internal data movement. Um, so a piece of the work that we've done with Guardian is is uh, we can bring different organizations together into a, the same ecosystem, but we don't automatically share any data with somebody who is outside of a client's uh, care team. So, but now with everything we've been talking about today uh, is a care team uh, could be much longer, larger and interprovincial and patients are moving uh, with work across the country and why can't their health teams move with them? Um, so of course, from an EMR's perspective, we need to be compliant with uh, legislation. And as the legislation moves forward, we can go along with it. Um, but our vision, our overall vision is that the data should move seamlessly to where it's needed um, and that mm. we should have as high of internal security with our health teams as we do uh, with external security. Yeah. You'll uh, follow up on that then, Heidi, is that I 
hadn't even thought about the challenges of the regional aspect as well and sort of as the care team as you talk about uh, isn't going to be specific to one region and you'll know more than anybody that Canada is uh, not one unified uh, health org um, you know there's different regions and there's different uh, um, uh, different authorities within those regions as well that all operate a little bit differently. And so what work can we do? What work can the federal government do? What work can we do um, uh, across province, uh, across different health authorities to improve the ability for EMRs, other technology providers to be able to seamlessly transfer data across the country? Um, I can comment briefly, and everyone else is able to chime in as well, but yeah. my my biggest thing is around the central data repositories. Um, I think that it might be a better idea to move into um, kind of more bridges rather than creating these central pools, because the central pools of data could actually block innovation into the market, um, as well as create large security uh, targets. So it, rather than having large vendors handling all of the data, it might be safer to have a high standard for the whole market and then have data only move and be where it is needed to be. And so uh, if you're working in the South with a team, we do need that whole health ecosystem to work together, but there's no need for that data to be accessible in the North if the client never went uh, to the North of their province kind of area. So we do need to blend that private uh, to public access of data um, because you know somebody might be accessing a private physio, but then they're accessing public uh, physician, and then those two systems won't talk. Um, but instead of a central data repository, more about uh, data movement in secure ways uh, as needed with the patient movement. Awesome. Uh, Brian, leads me to you. Uh, I, I, I noticed some of the work from leading healthcare hospital systems and aggregating data into data lakes, um, is central repositories uh, that Hadi was just talking about as well, but specific for a health system. Um, Providence has data lab, would love for you to talk uh, more on that, um, but, but how that came to be and the problems it's trying to solve for complex research projects. For sure, yeah, no, thank you. It's been interesting listening um to the comments so far um i think we you know we saw that there was a, a gap in the market i think other speakers have spoken about this in terms of how do you get access to data and not just on a one-off but not a you know i have a specific project can i get a one-time permission can i get my ethics approval can i can i use the data in this way but how could you start to do these things at scale how could you um start breaking down some of those barriers that prevent access um and so we had the idea um, and, and the support and encouragement of our partner at Genome BC to really think about this in terms of a product. So if you actually said, let's let's create a product that could be reused and used by many, um, you know, it, researchers being a, a first target group, but also commercial third parties being a, a target group, um, how would you have to build it? And so taking some of the, um, you know, I heard about the, you know, the caution, and I would totally agree, you, you ask, you know, you ask the privacy person, the ethics person, um, you know, and the data stewardship person to get in a room and do something creative. Well, that's 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 an interesting conversation, right? So, but if you start with, hey, we're actually doing this. So this is happening. How do we work backwards and put the right safeguards in place? What would we need to do to make this happen? Because it is happening. And that was the, the real intention with this data lab was to do it, to do it and learn by doing, learn about those, those you know, the, the safeguards that are needed. Um, you know, I think Heidi, what you mentioned about, you know, initially it was, we thought, well, yeah, we'll put all the data there. But then as we start to see the requests come in, we're like, well, we don't need all the data. And that's actually really expensive to put all the data in another place. And 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 it has its, its drawbacks. So, so we're actually learning by doing. Um, there was a comment about pilots and like, you know, my kind of mission is to never do a pilot is, is always just to do it and actually do it in production. And, and so uh, we we're hoping to kind of learn like a startup. And that's my, my background is startup and tech startups is, you know, let's, let's develop the market, develop the product by doing not, not just, um, 
you know, thinking. And, and I think some of the challenges with like sorting out all of our data problems will net will, will be stuck there forever. And I think everyone has a certain amount of data shame. You know, my data is not quite ready. It's not quite as structured. It's not quite as pretty as it should be. <laughs> and, and it's not quite ready for, for prime time. But you know what? We got to get past that and, and just get on with doing and, and seeing. And, and you know, it might fail. It might fail. But, um, you know, that's going to, I think, advance us. I'll follow up for you without talking about anything confidential. Um, where do you see commercial applications in the future going? Like, like the ultimate look forward five years, 10 years, um, and commercial parties utilizing ADA. Um, what were the outcomes from it? What are the problems or challenge or uh, that they would try to overcome? Sure. Um, I mean, I think we have to recognize that commercialization is how patients get to consume innovation. If it's a research idea and it never leaves the lab, then no patient will ever benefit. And so I think that that is part of it. And so I think we're partners in this. And I think more and more what's happening is, you know, if you have a, um, let's say a device that uses AI, it's not just a one-time identifier that you need to come up with. You need to both, you know, you need to validate it. You need to have multiple data sets to validate it, but then you have to be able to, to continue to have access to that data and you need to continue to train that model. So I think there's a partnership opportunity with healthcare to, to work with those partners, identify a need, develop a solution, implement that solution. There was comments about procurement that has to be part of it, but we have to be willing to actually use this solution as well as just help to develop it. And then we're part of that downstream. We're part of the the ongoing uh, maintenance and evolution of that. So I don't know if that speaks into your question, but that's just some thoughts there. Good, um, helpful for sure. And 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 moving over to Ahad, perhaps thinking about there's been a ton of conversations on privacy and security. We haven't even really gone into that much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, you just saw, but the FTC just did a crack down um, with uh, a telemedicine company in the U.S. for their privacy uh, concerns around patient data being used for advertising. Um, and so there is there is now legitimate concerns and, and actually regulatory crackdowns the other way. And so thinking through how do you think about privacy and security, but also patients owning their own data as well. And is that an important part uh, of leveraging data for better health outcomes? Yeah, I mean, I think I think privacy compliance, uh, some of these regulatory concerns that we've seen for years, I, I think I don't ever think that's that's going to go away. It, it's always going to be something that that we, we battle with and and there's always going to be situations in which um you know it raises concerns amongst our population right but you know focusing on that that second part of your question around you know patients kind of owning their data um you know uh, it plays a big role in in better health outcomes right and i know again owning data and who has access to that data can be a controversial topic depending on who you ask right so let's take a look at it from the clinician's perspective so some clinicians may be proponents for not giving access to data for many reasons. It could be, you know, data being shared on social media platforms, data taken out of context or misunderstood. Um, and if you look particularly at behavioral health, you know, perhaps ruminating over late night over a, a session or something that may have uh, uh, kind of emerged in that therapeutic session, right? Like maybe they're taking it out of context, thinking too deeply about this without having the right guidance. Um, so I get that side of it. But when I think about the patient, um, the more informed we are uh, the more empowered we are to improve our health care, our health decisions and lifestyles, right? You can't know, you can't fix what you don't know, right? And so um, have you ever tried like reading a medical report and, and just staring at, you know, all the different levels of these panels that you've gotten before? It's, it's, it's very difficult to read. It, it can be like, you know, reading in another language that you're not familiar with, right? And so what our company envisions is reports with digestible designs and information that truly empowers the patient to take control of their health and be partners in their own care, right? And so, you know, I'm a big proponent for helping patients understand their data, but giving them access to their data and having them play an active role in their own health care. 
couldn't uh, agree more. And, and, and I also imagine a world where people are always concerned about the patient becoming um, their own their own clinician and trying to diagnose and et cetera. But there is a world where the patient also agrees with the provider, with the physician, because they understand more holistically what the protocol is going to be, what the um, um, what their potential indications are as well. And so adherence could be improved from understanding yeah. as well. Um, Brian, I thought I'd go back to you now on usage of data, right? So now we're moving into potential feedback loops, always tying things to better health outcomes or reducing the cost or barriers of healthcare. Um, would love your perspective on the importance of utilizing data to better measure health outcomes and, 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 and hospital performance as well. Um, and also the work that's still to be done to improve uh, the measurement of outcomes, and especially as we're moving towards value-based care as well. Ooh, for sure, yeah, no, it's a good, good segue. Um, I mean, I think we're, you know, we're definitely here in BC um, seeing uh, the new premiers focus on what are we getting for the money we put in? Uh, what are the specific outcomes that have been achieved? Um, and I think this is very aligned with the, the, the idea of value-based healthcare, which is not a, a new idea, but, um, you know, how do you achieve objectives that the patients themselves value? And in order to do that, you first need to know how, you know, what does the, the patient value? Why are they getting the surgery? Do they, they, get the, they didn't get the surgery to get off the wait list. They, they got the surgery because they have a certain goal in mind um, or an activity they want to resume or... Um, something like that. And so, um, you know, we're looking at how can we start to capture and add those pieces of data to our system. And then at the same time, understand the activities that we deliver um, against that and, and, and dig into which activities actually have the highest correlation with the outcome that this patient actually wanted. And if you can do that, I think it allows us to start moving down this, this chain, this value chain where you, know, you could theoretically start eliminating things that don't add value to things that patients want. Um, and you could emphasize and spend the money that we have on producing more of those outcomes. So I think um, that's what um, Providence is focused on. We're really, we're doubling down on, on you know, value-based healthcare and investment there in the systems we need to capture. Um, and there's also an interesting, like the, the accountant in me is interested in the almost management accounting, like the costing. You know, what does it cost to do a certain procedure? What does it cost to see a patient? And, and there's differing costs depending on how you see the patient. So um, if you start to link the financials and then we start to get into this really interesting place where we can also start to think about optimizing the, the financial side of a delivery. Very interesting. And, and, and that that concept actually leads me directly to Heidi and sort of what role the EMR plays in the measurement of health outcomes, right? Because there's so much both financial and outcome data that could be potentially captured there, um, you know, such as waiting times or readmissions or like interactions. Um, so your thoughts on, on how we can utilize this data to better understand health outcomes as well. There is an enormous amount of very valuable data that is being actively collected in EMRs across the world. And then preventable health outcomes are just falling through the cracks because nobody is looking for it specifically. So there's an enormous amount of data. You can't just kind of crunch all of it, hold all of it. You need to really approach the problem with what is this specific question that you're trying to ask. And there's two ways that we can look at it too, is that there's the known risk factors and the known symptom patterns patterns in an individual's health that we know will have certain outcomes that could be caught and prevented much earlier. And then there's the population level work. Um, um, and then Brian mentioned the management level and, and cost saving work. So, so all of that data is accumulating in EMRs. Um, and there's different ways 
uh, and levels of integration. So with us, we have, of course, our um, automated reports built into the system, but it goes back to that what is the right question. So for future work for us, it's more important on what kind of data software and data analytics softwares that we're integrating with as an EMR um, to get those more valuable population level and health outcome prediction uh, models. And so kind of what was mentioned before, the EMR is not the end all be all for healthcare. We're uh, in a network of softwares and technologies that's really going to make this difference. And so from our perspective, uh, it's all about bringing that client back into that center of care. And you know, what do you want your data participating in? What are you comfortable with? Um, how can your data be used to impact not only your own health as a client, but your health of the overall community for that population level tracking. And uh, that's a big part of our EMR as a whole is bringing that client uh, more into their care. And then that'll echo down uh, to research and analytics down the road. That's great. We, we um, Ahad, from Heidi's comment on the uh, potential of predictive to talk to us about the role that mental health will play in a better understanding the holistic profile of an individual. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, now more than ever, what we're seeing, um, we understand that mental and physical health are connected, right? And that, um, you know, if we're passively analyzing sessions, you know, whether it be using forms of NLP or linguistic cues, coupled with, you know, maybe wearable data, we can make more, we can get better information on the patient and help uh, inform them on some of the, um, you know, some of the things they can do to improve their health. And so I'll give you, I'll just give you an example of, of what I mean. So <clears throat> we, we hone in on things like cognitive processing, right? Cognitive load, how distracted someone's in a session, how difficult they find it to navigate a particular topic, right? Um, and one of the precursors for this is that, um, when we are stressed, right, uh, we activate our amygdala, which activates a sympathetic response, fight, flight, or freeze, right? During that portion of time, when that part of our brain is activated, we see less activation of our prefrontal cortex, uh, particularly the Broca's area, which is responsible for language, how we express ourselves, how we put together sentences, things of that nature, right? So we're literally seeing a physiological reaction to stress that's happening that is influencing one's language and how they express themselves, right? And so, you know, seeing that interconnectedness um, can really help us to, you know, drive better out, better health outcomes amongst patients, right? And so, like, uh, I'm very optimistic about, you know, uh, utilizing things like that. Um, you know, again, looking at wearable data, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, what what's sleep like for the individual, right? Lack of sleep will influence how someone does in a session, whether it be in the behavioral health space or as you converse with their doctor, a general practitioner, right? Um, heart rate variability, diet, all these different pieces of data we capture, you know, having that kind of work in congruence with some of these um, passive elements of data monitoring, can, uh, again, will I think is the next frontier. Awesome. And with that, I think this is a perfect time to wrap it up. I very much enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Brian, Heidi, Ahad, and Brent uh, for your contributions, and I'll kick it over.